Hey, hey, everybody, welcome on in to ClayShare Live. Every Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern Time, we do a little live tutorial, a little demo, a little Q&A session sometimes, and tonight we have a giveaway. Oh, we're gonna be giving away Mako Stroking Coats. We have two 12 packs of these that we're gonna be giving away. Huge thank you to Mako for being this month's sponsor. So we're gonna give these away at the end. You can't have it now, you got to wait till the end. And uh, to get us there, I've got a little uh, using stroking coat demo. And I was thinking about, I had a few different ideas on this and I, I think I might go in a different direction than I had planned, so we'll see. This is a little uh, seat of our pants here. Uh, in ClayShare News, I wanted to uh, put out there that we have a new downloadable rim template design. It's our little handles with a little trays with handles built in and so here's some and we made these so that they work perfectly with the spherical rectangles from gr pottery forms so if you have those and you are struggling to get a rim template and i know there's a bunch of them out there i know that uh, debbie uh, de la designs has really great cutters so if you want cutters check out her cute designs um, the great thing about our downloadable templates is you just download them. They only cost a few dollars. You download them onto paper and then you can transfer them onto craft foam and cut them out. If you have a die cutter, like a Cricut or a Silhouette, you can just use that and it can cut it for you. So you can get your rim template really easily. And these are the spherical rectangles from GR Pottery Forms and they do stack. And if you use the next size up, form you can use the templates and you can stack them and do like two stacked with the bigger I'll get there I need someone handing me stuff if you use the bigger one and you could stack them together right so you got lots of options with these we also decided to make them size for the rounded rectangles that GR Pottery Forms does that's these shapes right here so if you're out there and you have these shapes and you really struggle with that rounded end I know that's a difficult thing because you've got, got a straight edge, you know you can cut along it. When you've got a rounded edge, it can be hard to get a really nice consistent shape with them. So we went ahead and made for these four sizes dedicated templates for the rounded rectangles. So these are them cut out of MDF on a laser cutter. If you don't have a laser cutter, of course, you can make them out of craft foam. And the great thing about these is if you're using a Cricut or a Silhouette, the longest one is only 18 inches long. And so with a Cricut or any other die cutter, you can get a mat that's 12 by 24. So you can cut this in one piece. So you'll be good to go. So I think that's awesome. Another little trick I'm going to share with you who may not have GR Pottery Forms out there. Before... I knew, well, I don't even think Gerald Pottery Forms was making the forms at the time, but when I would make my own draped forms, you could actually use two by fours and just cut them to length to fit with these, especially for the smaller ones. So little trick, if you don't have any uh, GR Pottery Forms right now and you want to get these rim templates and make them out of craft foam, you can use a two by four. Yes, folks, I even do that in a class. I teach you how to make a tray with a two by four. It's not called the two by four tray class, although it should be, because <laughs> that would be fun. But yeah, it's, 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 we make a tray with a two by four. You can make a tray with anything. You don't need a two by four, you can make your own form. But I love Jeff's GR Pottery Forms because they're just so well made and you know you get stackable forms so you can make some really great things. So that's what I wanted to share. We're having a Memorial Day sale on all the downloadables, so all the rim templates, now through the 31st of May. You can save 33% and it's automatic. You don't have to do anything. It's just added to, it's just all added in there. And if you're a premium member of ClayShare, you save even more. So be sure you're signed in. And then I wanted to share this with you. These are the trays that I made with those spherical rectangles. Aren't they cute? So they turned out great. I did put feet on them. And you can see these are bone dry, ready to be bisque fired. I wouldn't bisque them like this. That's a lot of weight for this bottom one to carry. You could do two, potentially, for saving space, but I don't think I would do all three. I think that's asking too much. And then I wanted to show you this. Um, a little sneak peek, we are working on plaque packs. So for GR Pottery Forms plaque shapes, we're working on a plaque pack downloadable template set for you guys. So that's a preview. Pretend you didn't see it. 
<laughs> you're going to say it again. <laughs> no, you're cutting yours with your cricket now. I love that. I love the instant gratification. Like, I download it, I cut it out on my cricket. You can download it and print it out on paper, and then you can take your paper and you can use spray adhesive and stick it on craft foam and then just cut once. Or you can cut it out of the paper, lay the paper on craft foam or tar paper, and then trace it. You can even put it on MDF yourself and cut it out with a jigsaw or a banding saw. All right, a couple questions folks are always asking me about using the long shapes. So whenever you make anything like a tray or a platter, they're prone to bowing in the middle. And that happens a lot because we're drying and as it dries, the middle is drying last and so it's bowing up. So what I do is until the piece is bone dry, I have these weight bags on it. And I do have a tutorial on making weight bags, but it just sits like this until it's completely dry and then it goes in the kiln. And so we're going to be doing some stuff with this one right here tonight. We're going to have some good times. But the uh, little bit of kitty litter came out of my weight bag because that's what I use. I use cat litter. You could use rice, you could use beans, um, you could use sand, just regular sand, not, not cat litter. You can use clumping cat litter, non-clumping cat litter, anything that you can use. Lentils, I don't know what you guys are using to make weight bags. And then this was actually just a t-shirt. This was the center part of a t-shirt cut out into a square. I poured a pile of cat litter in it, gathered up the corners, and look, I wanted a no-sew option. So this is a rubber band, and I just rubber banded. I don't know if I want to go to camera two because I can show it a little closer. But I just rubber banded. There's no sewing happening, folks. Because I got no time to sew. Um, this one, I went one better. This was the sleeve of a shirt. <laughs> and I tied the ends in knots. So you don't have any rubber bands? Okay, that's fine. Just tie them in knots. And that's it. It works. I have used pellets from a pellet stove uh, in the past. This one, uh, again, I had a rubber band. So, and you make them as big as you want. This was the back side of that same shirt. This is the front. You see how I made two different sized weight bags? And if I need more sand or cat litter in this one or whatever you're using as your filler, I can just open this up, add more filler, close it back up, and put it on my piece and use it. But I really like the sleeves. <laughs> and you can use socks. If you have some socks floating around that you don't, like you, you know how you always lose a sock? And they would make great weight bags. So take that one sock that you can't find the other sock for, right? And turn that into a weight bag and I guarantee you'll find the other sock. So now you get two weight bags because you're already using one as a weight bag. So there's your how to find a missing sock and get two weight bags out of it. <laughs> All the tips tonight. You just got your Cricut machine and you had a question and called customer service and the girl who spoke with you couldn't have been nicer and more helpful. Oh, yay. And so Jan wants to know if there are instructions for using the Cricut to cut out the forms. Yes, Jan, we did a Good Morning Clay Share. Not this week. Uh, was it last week or week before? Two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, we did a Good Morning Clay Share, and Kevin walks you through that, how to use your Cricut to cut out templates. It's so easy. And that's our Monday morning broadcast just for premium members of Clay Share that we do here. So you used Unpop Popcorn the last time you made weight bags because it's what you had on hand. I completely agree. Whatever you have, don't think you've got to buy fancy stuff. All right, so the kitty litter downside I have noticed is the kitty litter comes out of my weight bags. So I get cat litter on the surface where I just blow it off. If my piece is a little damp, sometimes the kitty litter can become embedded in it and it does not fire out. I now have speckled clay. Maybe it's a way to make a speckled clay. I don't know. But this is a tray. Oh, and so what was I showing you? Go to, go to camera two. So this is the rounded rectangle one. And you can see how we have a great tray right here. This is the smallest, long, skinny, rounded rectangle. And you see how you have this really nice rounded edge. You got these handles for picking it up. So you have a really cute serving tray. Yes, you could put texture on this. We're going to do something to this. So we're not going to do texture on it. But you could. <laughs> Crickets are really, uh, or any die cutter, is a really great tool 
to, to add to our, our pottery studio. And just in life, we use it to make t-shirts, to do vinyl cutouts. You can do a lot with them. I am not gonna say don't get certain brands, get whatever one you have used. If you have a friend who has one, try one out with them. I tried Silhouette and it just didn't work for me. I ended up buying a Cricut and out of the box, it was so easy to use. I'm not knocking the Silhouette at all cutter. I'm just telling you that I needed apparently something that was um, a little simpler because my life is so busy. I don't have time to spend figuring out anything that's more complicated than making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. So, you know. All right. So we've got a tray and we're gonna do some stuff with Mako. And I've been wanting to do what I'm gonna do now for a while and I hadn't done one. So we're gonna, let me set you all up so you can see you can go to overhead. We're gonna do a fish, a fish platter, fish. I, I drew some fishes. I drew some fast fish and they're not awesome. They're just fish to give me an idea of what does a fish look like? Because you know, sometimes you're in the studio and you're working and you're gonna make something and all of a sudden your brain's like, what does a fish look like? Like my brain shuts off sometimes. And it's like, I know what a fish looks like, but sometimes maybe I don't. So we're gonna do some fish platters. And I, the thing that I'm on the fence about is if I'm gonna do it as a solid scrofito, so we paint our fish shape on and then we do a scrofito, or are we just gonna paint a fish on with a brush and just do brush strokes for our decoration of our fish? It's uh, just my big, that's my difficult decision today in my life is which way we're gonna do it. Now, this is a bone dry plate, almost bone dry. It's like a day from being bone dry, really. And the clay I used for this is Laguna B Mix, which is a really smooth, no grog clay. It's a porcelainous clay. It's got a lot of kaolin in it, which is called China clay as well. And, you know, I'm, I'm just using a regular cheap pottery sponge because this is a smooth clay. I don't have to worry about bringing grog or grit or sand to the surface. If you're using a sandy clay, you might want to use a piece of chamois or you could get those white sponges from Cheryl Mud Tools. Those are great for groggy clay. So that's a little tip if you're watching this and you have groggy clay and you're struggling because just doing this right here on a grog clay will bring that grog to the surface and then you have a really rough surface, which we don't really want. You want to see how to paint a fish. Well, I got a quick fish, mine looks good. Uh, it's, we can do a quick fish paint and then we can do a quick fish scrofito if we have time. We'll see. And I'm gonna use the stroke and coats. Now, the stroke and coats are a glaze product. So I'm gonna put them on, yes, greenware, and then I'll bisque fire and then I'll glaze. Although if you're into single firing, you could do this and then put your clear glaze on, which is, or whatever color you'd like, I'm gonna use a clear. And you could single fire it. I don't single fire though. That's just, don't do that. Okay, paint a fish first and then carve a fish after. So we're gonna start with some Mako Stroke and Coat. Let me grab my palette. It's over there. Sorry folks, gotta go grab my palette. Now you can use any kind of palette you want. You know, if you're gonna be painting small, super detailed things, you're gonna want something like this because you can keep all your colors in this, right? And you keep them moist. And I have two different palettes in the studio I'm using that are like this. You put a little piece of sponge in here that's damp and it will keep it wet forever, basically. And this is good for small detailed things. If you're gonna do a big wash of color, then you might just want a little container or something to mix it up in, a little cup, and mix up a bunch of color. Now the stroke and coats, and a lot of underglaze products are really thick and they can be difficult when we try to brush them to get nice smooth brush strokes. So I have found that I just water them down a little bit and it works out great. You know, if they're already really thin, don't water them down. And the thing I'm gonna do, you could do with underglaze, you could do with a glaze, if you had a glaze that doesn't move a lot, like a celadon. So there's a lot of options or the stroke and coats. All right, so it's a fish. Fish should be fish should be blue. I got moody blue. Should they be blue? 
I don't know though. Fish could be any color you want. It's up to you. <laughs> so, I mean, I think blue would be a nice color. Oh, and for those who were with me last week when we did our floral plate, and I also did the tutorial on doing a Mako stroke and coat test plate, those are going in the kiln tomorrow, and I'll have them out first thing Saturday morning. So I will take photos of those. It is open studio weekend. Uh, things are going to be a little crazy around here for me until Monday. So if you need to reach me between now and then, just uh, realize that I'm, I've got 8 million fires in the irons in the fire right now. All right, we're going to use moody blue for this um, just because I want to. So do you need to apply glaze if you use stroke and coat on green wear? Well, that's the question, right? Or if you cover the entire surface with stroke and coat, no, because it is a glaze, as long as you have a nice, good coverage. If you have a thin cover application, if you do like watered down, you will want a clear glaze on top. So I'm just going to use the, ooh, this is sealed. Ooh, it's brand new. Yay. All right. So I'm going to squeeze this out and see how thick it is. I'm going to see the consistency of this. If you're on the overhead. Mm -hmm. So let's give this a little mix. It's a little gloppy. So I'd like it a little thinner than this. And I've got, I just have this little tiny squirt bottle here, which I've been keeping water in just because it makes it handy. And then I can, I have a jug of distilled water. And I can use that just to make sure there's nothing in there. But honestly, when I'm working, I just see what I did. I dripped water on there. Let's clean that off. Usually when I'm working, if I need water, I just use tap water. But if you're really concerned about consistency and getting exactly the same results every time, if you use a distilled water, you know there's nothing in it. Tap water can have stuff in it, you know, minerals and other impurities and things. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying that there's stuff in it. All right, so I mix this up. And I'm going to switch brushes because I want one that's going to have a fine point. And now I'm going to decide, am I just going to go for it and paint? And be like, oh, don't mess this up, lady. <laughs> and questions about the stroke and coats and firing. So this is Laguna B-Mix 5. And I fire it to cone 5. You can use stroke and coat. Some colors, uh, I've heard people say they can go to cone 10. I have never done cone 10 with them, but I've heard it said that it can be done. All right, so let's get some color and let's hope I don't mess it up. Are you ready? I'm gonna scooch the... So I suggest if you're gonna do this and you haven't done something like this before, get a piece of paper and practice because you are going on your surface. So if you mess it up, you can wipe it down. Do you see what I mean? Flowing, you know, you, you will run out of the underglaze and you'll have to get more. Um, this fish I'm making is a imagination fish. which is the best kind because you can't mess them up when you draw them. It's kind of going to look like a long, skinny guppy. And then we'll do a little tail, some little boops on the tail. So normally I would do a solid fish and I would do stroke and coat, uh, you know, filling it in. And then I would go ahead and carve because I really like to carve things. How about an eye? So here's the thing. How big of an eye do you make? This big, maybe? Put 
put a little mouth on that. So this isn't supposed to be a uh, like true to life fish. If you want that, you can get that. But we're just making something really fun and whimsical. It's going to be on this little tray. It's going to be summertime, you know. So let's make our little scales going back. Just little bumps. So don't be afraid. Don't be afraid when you're doing this. Just jump in and do it. If you mess it up, it's okay. Just go ahead and wash it off. Wipe it down. Start again. Look at that fish. That's the silliest fish ever. I love it. It's awesome. So we need something on the, we need a border. So let's go ahead and brush a border on. Because it looks kind of naked without a border. This particular one looks naked. I'm not going to do multiple coats. I know when you saw me brushing it on, I went back over a little bit. So just doing that kind of gave me two coats, I think. So I'm just going to let it be, oh, look, I got a blob. So that can lead down a road of, am I going to make more dots and just let the dots be a decorative element? Because it could be. You could do little polka dots all over it, like bubbles. Yeah, that's a, that's a good thing, right? Or you could do stripes coming out from the end. So you can play with all kinds of different patterning options. I'm going to come in a little bit, I think, with my blue plate special. It's fish. That's the blue plate special tonight. All right, so just for showing you how to remove color, so you just wipe it. And I'm just turning my sponge as I wipe, and you see it just came off. So you would do that to your whole tray. Don't get your tray too wet or too saturated because you could crack it. I wouldn't do this on a bone dry tray. I would try to do this on leather hard or bisque fired. It's just my piece was not, it was too dry. That doesn't stop me. Bubbles? Oh, well, yeah, but I think we'll do bubbles coming from the fishy, right? So we'll just do some little dots over here. Drawing a circle is so challenging. Now I do have my little dot makers from the ma dot mandala class. Uh, oh, no, those are down at my other studio. Got to bring those up. So we did some little dots. We'll do one here. So it's like he's got little bubbles coming out of his, his mouth, right? Not too bad. I mean, for my first fish, not too, too shabby. Why am I using a glaze on a greenware? Well, Stroke and Coat is also usable as an underglaze. So the kind of product it is, you can use it as a glaze. You can use it as an underglaze. You can thin it down and use it for staining texture. You can put it on a piece like we're going to do next and carve into it. And you can't carve in to bisqueware because it's already fired. I mean, you, I guess you could if you really got at it with something, but much easier to do it now this way. All right, so I gotta stop fiddling. I'm just gonna leave it as I brush another. Yeah, I know. All right, so I may go in and work on my border a little more just to make it even all the way around. But it's just the versatility of something like stroke and coat, right? We can do it like this on dry greenware. If, you, if that's what you got and you wanna work, you don't have to be limited. All right, so I'm going to sit this somewhere, and we're going to grab this little guy. We're going to do painting in prime time next. We're going to paint faces on pottery. So I'll, I'll give you a little sneak peek in a sec of what we're going to do. I'm going to grab a board to work on because I'm going to make a little mess. Since I'm going to do a fish, this time we're going to make the fish solidly filled in, and then we'll carve. 
And again, this is a bone dry little, little tray here. There is a ton of bird noise outside my house. Use the back end of your brush for dots. Yeah, the back end of your brush is great for dots. Anything that you can dip in and just stamp on there will give you a really nice dot. Thank you for uh, reminding me about that. So stroke and coats will come up shiny once bisked. Yeah, and glaze won't really stick to them when you glaze on top of them, but it doesn't need to because the stroke and coat is the glaze. So if you wanted to use it more as an underglaze with a glaze on top, you're going to want to work on bisqueware, right? Of course, you could use something else, but stroke and coats, it's like you can have just one thing. You can have it as your glaze and your underglaze as a back look. Looks pretty good. Let's, let's make sure, oh, I didn't check the other one. <laughs> when I put my fish on here, let's make sure that when you flip it over, it's not upside down. Let's check over here. Did I? Did I? Of course, it's upside down. I mean, it just depends how you flip it over. You flip it this way. Oh, no, it's perfect. It's fine. <laughs> so I'm going to let that sit, but I am going to put the weight bags back on that. All right, we're going to do a littler fish. We're going to do this little, little chubbier fish right here now. We're going to do that one. Um, we're going to stick with blue. Uh, mix a little black maybe in here. I want a darker color. So I'm going to mix a little of the black into this. Or a lot of black. Your choice. <laughs> you know, however it works. What is the GR form I'm using for both? So the big fish was the rounded rectangle and that's the one. Let me grab it. That's the long skinny one and I know what it is because it's on my rim template. So that first one I was using the four and a half by 13 and a half rounded rectangle from GR Pottery Forms that, and I use this template for it. And then this little guy is the small rectangle plaque shape. And I can't tell you about that template yet because we're working on the plaque pack templates, which hopefully we'll get those to you all soon. I hear Kevin groaning like, oh, not till after Monday though. Yes, yes, not till after Monday. So I made like a, bl uh, a blue, midnight blue, really dark. But we're going to do Scraffito with this, so I wanted it a little darker. Yeah, Stroke & Co. is very stable. That's a good point. It, it doesn't move much. No. So we're going to paint a little fishy. And I personally prefer going this way than painting on the surface because you fill it in as you know a blobby shape it's a blobby fish and then you're going to go ahead and carve him out carve out his details so you can go back over and change the shape a bit if you didn't make him fat enough or you know if you need to make him a little longer when you're drawing on the surface you're kind of stuck in now he looks like a little goldfish cracker so, you know, it's all about food. So we're just going to put that on. And then I'm going to do a thick border because I'm going to carve on the border. Normally when I do Scraffito, I do it on leather hard greenware, not as dry as this. But Vermont has gotten, we've been getting crazy warm weather lately. This like heat waves moved in and super dry for us. Yeah, exactly. It's, we're usually, usually incredibly humid. We are temperate rainforest up here and it's been dry for us, which We are not used to. Which is good. It is a dry heat. All right, so I'm just going to put, put one coat of this on, and then you let it set to dry. Normally on leather hard clay, it's going to take 
a few hours. Usually I'll put it on and then the next day I'll actually come and do the carving. So I never expect to put it on and do the carving the same day, but this is so dry. Look at that. I'm going to be able to put, I'm going to be able to carve it now, like in a couple minutes. So we're going to let that set for a second and put this to the side. Now if I wanted to go back to my painted one and add some features to it, like put a, I'm debating on this. His eye bothers me, you know? So if I want to go back in and put a little dark dot in the center, I can do that. I think I will. I'm going to do that for this one. Oh, let's do the back. So if you don't have a, a paintbrush, I mean, you should have a paintbrush in your studio. That's kind of a, you know, we some sort of a paintbrush. You've got a needle tool, though, so uh, use the back of your needle tool. Get your stroke and coat on it, and then dot. See? Perfect, perfect little circle on that. Get a little black here. Ooh, that just made me think of something. And I was going to leave it alone. Let's put a perfect dot there. And there. And there. So I have this great dot mandala class. If you've ever wanted to make a mandala in pottery, but you didn't think you could, right? Because they can get a little intricate sometimes. I show you an easy way to do it. Kind of like what I'm doing now. There, that one got a little big just because I had more stroke and coat on it. But maybe I'll go back and make my border thicker and do dots all along it. I don't know, I haven't decided. If you leave me alone with it long enough, I will fiddle with it till I mess it up. So let's just put it to the side <laughs> and see how our other piece is doing. This, doing the dots is really fun. It's simple. And I do it on bisque pieces. And you just make your dots and you make patterns. And I, I, have, uh, I have some designs that I give you guys for that. All right, so for carving, uh, I'm going to do some scurfito. And I love Diamond Core Tools. The L3 Diamond Stylus tool is the small football, large football. is always my go-to. If I could only take one carving tool with me to the desert island, you know, along with my favorite music, I would bring the L3. It's just great. You can do Mishima with it. You can do Scrofito with it. It's got a skinny end. It's got a fat end. It's, it's really, it's really great. I'm excited for Diamond Core Tools joining us on Clay Share Day. That's going to be on June 15th. It's going to be a one day mini clay conference all free. We have a whole day's worth of demos and tutorials lined up for you all. And Diamond Core Tools is going to join us. They're going to have a person um, in-house doing demos and they got a new tool. So that's really exciting. All right, let's start with our fishy. And I'm just going to carve where his little face is going to be. And his scales will start back here. Oh, well, you know what I didn't do on him? I didn't give him fins, the dorsal fins. Nobody caught me. And then what are these the down here called? Pectoral fins. He didn't have any of those either. My fish would be having a hard time swimming. But we got it. We got him. He's good. All right. So I'm just going to brush my crumbs out of the way. And usually I'll keep a little bucket of water. I have one right here. Right here. So that I can tip it up. And I can just brush my crumbs into water so I don't get crumbs everywhere and make a big old mess. And also the fact that you don't want clay crumbs all over the place. So i just shake that out. The L1's your go-to. You never even put it away because you know you're going to use it. The L1 is also a good one. Is that the crown? And is it this one, the crown and the little uh, tiny ball one? Is that the L1? Oh, I think that's the L2. I think I wrote on that L2. Uh, let's see. Do I have an L1? It's debatable. <laughs> I have a habit of giving away my, my tools, which isn't a bad thing for you guys. <laughs> uh -huh. All right, so 
I'm letting everything dry a little bit. Let's do an eye. We'll do an eye up here. So I'm just going to make one big circle. And then we'll just brush it out of the way. And then another circle inside. Why not? Uh, he's a happy little fish. Just going to give him a little smiley face. And then I'm just going to draw his outline. It makes such a difference, this outline part. I don't know why. It, it, it just really changes the whole piece. So I'm going to actually do the outline first. It lets you clean up. So if you're doing those brush strokes and you feel like they're a little messy and you're not really happy with them, the good news is when you do the outline, you can take away the messy. So there's my outline. I'm going to brush them clean in my water. Then we're just going to go ahead and Make scales, just bumps. That's it. And you can make them as close to each other as you want or as far from each other. Don't need to have any drawing skills. This one I feel is easier for folks to do than the painting. The painting is, it is a little intimidating, right? You're just going in and hoping it works. Now we're going to do his little fins back here, his tail fin. So let's clean them off. Look his little details show up. Um, I'm going to make him have an open mouth. Like that. And let's put some details here. And down here. You see how easy it is to do it with carving? If you've stayed away from carving because you think it's really difficult, right here, it was easy. It was really easy. Um, I could have gone ahead and painted the whole entire thing and then just carved him out if I didn't want to have a silhouette. But I've got a plan. I'm going to do something down here. So. Scraffito is very forgiving. It really is. It's really, um, out of all the carving styles out there, I think Scraffito is the most forgiving. I have been carving pieces and then made a mistake. So what you do is you just rub it flat and then put the underglaze or your slip or whatever you're using for your medium, stroke and coat, stroke and coat whatever it is, you put that back on covering the area that you smooth down flat and you're going to be able to just go right over it and nobody's going to know that you made a mistake. And then it looks like you did some crazy magic, right? And all you did was just fix the little oops. So I went ahead and how do you get black underglaze on my brusher brusher brush? Who knows? Must have it. So I'm going to wipe that clean. Actually, I'm just going to take my tool and gently scrape away. I know it's bone dry clay. We shouldn't brush on it. So just keep that in mind. Ah, oh, Charlotte, thank you. So we got our little fishy friend and now we've got a border. We've got to do something with our border, right? So I'm thinking uh, something nautical, seaweed. I'm gonna do some seaweed. So what does seaweed look like? Seaweed comes up and kind of wiggles and then comes back down, right? Just kind of wiggly stuff. So that looks very seaweed-esque to me. Maybe we got a little seaweed. Oh, that seaweed fell down. See, that seaweed fell over. Seaweed have little uh, veins in it, like leaves. I don't know. I don't really look too closely at seaweed to tell you the truth, but 
That's okay. We can make it up. If anybody ever looks at your seaweed carvings and says, that's not what seaweed looks like, you just look at them and be like, great. <laughs> when you do yours, you make it look different. Because <laughs> I, I don't know what seaweed looks like. I mean, I kind of do, right? It's ribbons, ribbony, floating in the water. So maybe you know a lot about seaweed and you're really good at carving it, then you make it look fabulous, right? Do you think other people than us will know what's seaweed? Do you think people will be watching? Well, no, not watching. People will see this plate after it's done. And be like, ah, oh, I love your seaweed. Just going to brush it down there. So we have this top bit. How are we on time? Okay, we got the giveaway. So I can't, I got to stop at quarter of so I can do the giveaway. So we're almost, almost out of time. So we got this spot here. And the question is, do you want to leave that just a hard line or do you want to go in and let's flip this around. I'm going to use the wide end. So I just turned it around and I'm just going to pull upwards, kind of following the lines I've made for the sea edge of the seaweed and just removing the color. You don't have to. You could leave the whole thing there. But this is what makes graffito really cool is when you remove that clay, you create negative space. When you move the slip covered, or in this case, the stroke and coat covered clay, you're creating negative space, which will make that design we just did pop. You don't have to do it. You can leave it. And you know, scraffito means to scratch. And this is why. Just scratching away. And again, I do recommend leather hard, not dry, like I'm doing. This is a big no-no in pottery. We don't like to do bone dry carving. Just because it creates more clay dust than you really should be creating. So... If you were going to do this and you had a bone dry piece of clay that you were going to carve, I would suggest you do it outside and, you know, put on one of your respirators with the cartridge rated for silica just to protect yourself. So I'll go ahead and oh, I'm going to get down here and I'll finish the seaweed garden. I guess, I guess it's a garden, right? I'll finish the seaweed garden on my own and uh, post pictures of it. And this will probably go in the next, next bisque fire. Cause look, it's so dry. It's basically ready for firing. So that gives you an idea. I kind of like just the little seaweed on the bottom and not on the sides. I don't know if I'll do the whole thing. Yeah. It's more simple than more th simple than you thought it would be. Woohoo. I love hearing that. So that's one of the things, um, you know, when I teach, people are always afraid it's going to be hard and they're going to be, and, and I mean, some things are hard, yes, but I always like to start you off with things that are really approachable because then you can do it and do it with success and have something that you made that you're happy with. I mean, look, he's happy, a happy little fish. And yeah, I mean, first time I've ever put a fish on a, on a piece of pottery. So it came out like a goldfish cracker. So what? My, my daughter loves goldfish, so somebody's going to love it. Have long seaweed upside. Ooh, brilliant idea. Like kind of wiggly, wiggly, wiggly. Yeah, I like that. Let me uh, do one. Because seaweed, that stuff can get long, right? Yeah, I know. We got the giveaway. Seaweed's fun and easy to draw, everyone. Do you see? It's just... Try to draw a straight line and don't. Just make a, make a mess of it. Be like, I'm going to draw a straight line, and then it doesn't work at all. Be like, yep, that's seaweed right there. I 
I love that suggestion for the long seaweed, Danelle. Thank you. That was brilliant. I love it. I'll do another little skinny one there. Seaweed. Fun with seaweed. And then just keep going. We're going to put seaweed on the whole thing. But I, I, again, have to give away some stuff. So we can't do it. <sighs> you just made a fish bisque stamp. Tis the season. I have done a fish stamp. That's the only thing I've made. I made a bisque stamp. Yeah, years ago. But other than that, I have done no fishes. Why? What have I been missing out on? Missing the fishing. <laughs> Could put bubbles, yeah, could put bubbles on the top, like up in here. Oh, swirlies, right? We, do you guys want to just come hang out with me and give me suggestions when I work? Because I'm always looking for new ideas, and I love the idea of the bubbles on the top. Right? Yeah, I love it. That is a great idea. So let's give, some, let's give away some Mako stroking coats now. What do you think? All you folks want to win some stroking coats? It's 12 pack. 12 of these. 12 stroking coats. Now, um... With all our giveaways, in order to be entered, you just go to clayshare.com and you sign up for our email list. That's it. It's all you have to do. And if you stay subscribed, you automatically get entered. If you unsubscribed, you don't get entered. So keep that in mind. You know, it does mean you'll get our, we send one email a week. It's not overwhelming, I promise. And it just tells you what we've done for classes, tutorials, and demos. So that way you'll know the free demo every week. So if you're not a premium member, you can go and watch one of our weekly tutorials. Premium members, you get our two private broadcasts. And we have a class averaging usually three classes a month right now on top of that. In addition to the over 400 classes we have on ClayShare that are already there and recorded, each one's at least an hour long. Some are more because there's a lot of stuff to learn in the pottery world. And there's not just making pottery, it's glazing pottery, it's carving like we did tonight, it's kilns, kiln maintenance, and also ClayShare Con is on there. ClayShare Day from last year is on there. And ClayShare Day from this year is going to be in a couple weeks. So that'll be on there as well. Whew! So much stuff. I know. All right. I, if you looked, you saw the winner. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm going to announce the winners, and then I will email Mako and let Mako know who won. And then Mako will send you your prize. I don't have it to send to you, so we will give Mako your info, and then uh, you will get your awesome stroke and coats. And if you don't win, don't worry. You can get some really great deals on Mako products, because Clayscapes Pottery is doing 20% off for the month of May for Mako off all Mako products. So that's the Stroke and Coats, the Mako Stonework Glazes, which are fabulously awesome. I love them. They're crystalline glazes. We did that glaze tutorial a couple weeks ago with the Night Moth over Blue Opal. Holy cats, that's crazy good. Uh, also, their Lavender Mist with Fluxes. All the Flux are good. And that also includes the Mako Under Glazes and the Mako Brushes. Anything Mako makes. Oh, and the Lusters, which I'll be doing next week. I was going to do it tonight, but I realized that there's no way I can do this and lusters in the single broadcast. So we'll do lusters next week. Okay, first winner of the Mako 12 pack stroke and coat prize is. Does it matter which order I say them in? Oh, I've shuffled them around, so don't tell me that they were in order. <laughs> T or A? <laughs> Okay, the first winner is Anita Marie Briggs. Anita Marie, you're going to get yourself some Mako stroking coats. I know if you hand me uh, a little card, or two cards, I'm going to shuffle them around. So as a question, do you have to be a premium member to win? Not for this, absolutely not. Nope, this is open to the general public. So we do a special thing for premium members, but... This is not it. Okay, first winner is Anita Marie Briggs. Kevin's having a conniption over there. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> I know, congrats. Woo! <laughs> Anita Briggs translates to Sally Roper. <laughs> oh, Sally, one of these days, you're going to win. 
And then our second winner of the Mako Stroke and Coat Prize is Trisha Yoakum. Trisha Yoakum, congratulations. You and Anita Marie are going to get yourselves a 12 pack of Mako Stroke and Coats. Uh, so I was about to say before, you know, Kevin freaked out for, on me for going off topic because I do that all the time and that's just how I am, that we have this really great thing we're doing for premium members, which is our goodie box. And it's not sponsored and you don't have to be a member. You don't have to do anything. It's just something I give presents to our members sometimes. Just saying that. I'm not saying what's in it to the public. Only premium members know because it's a secret. But you get something in a box that I send to you of my stuff. Not sponsored by anybody. <laughs> All right, so that's what we got. Uh, we did some stroke and coat fish platters. Uh, so next, what are we going to do in prime time for my premium members? We are going to make little face plates. We're going to paint faces on plates. These are bisque, by the way. So you could have used bisque plates instead of uh, the bone dry green wear for painting on, but we're gonna paint cute, cute faces next. So come back for that and find out who gets the goodie box. I'll tell you who wins that next as well. All right.